After losing the target during a rescue mission, a Navy SEAL is given a new task. To act as the male nanny for the deceased husband's family or figuring out what he was working on. Hello, everyone. I'm Caleb J. I'm Connor Izagari. Welcome to a new episode of Beyond the Bad. I know what you're thinking. I just described a pretty uh, out there action movie. Wrong. We're talking about the Disney <laughs> Disney film starring at the time super hot action star Vin Diesel, um, known as the Pacifier. Uh, critics absolutely hated this film. When I looked it up, I did not realize how much they were not fans of it. Um, nonetheless, it would go on to be a pretty big hit at the box office at the time. Um, I know you're, some people, if you look at it, you're like, well, that's not that big. This is like pre-MCU days. So this was this was a big hit. Um, and but really enough, where it has where I did enjoy that success, it kind of is, to, in my opinion, been largely forgotten in Diesel's filmography. I would say a little bit of that is self-induced because of how many fucking Fast and Furious films he's pumping out. But still, it's like you you ask people about Vin Diesel, like, oh, the Fast and Furious guy, oh, the Reddit guy. Yeah, I even hear some people pull out Triple X. Never the past fire. So um, on that note, I'll shoot it over to Connor for those uh, scores and go from there. First, though, it is interesting how we kind of have, had to reevaluate how we measure box office success because of the MCU. Isn't that interesting? Like yeah. $158 million used to be a surefire win. Now it's chump change. That's nothing. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> Actually, um, Disney. Like if Disney's name is attached to it, that is chump change. Yeah, that's, you know, we bury it. We don't talk about it again. Uh, the Pacifier has a 21%. Uh, critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, a 58% audience score, which I think is a lie. A lot of people secretly like this movie. I think they're just ashamed to admit it. Uh, I, th- I think what it is, and it's what I, I know I've kind of I've talked to you about. It's like, I feel like it's people that just don't like Vin Diesel because of the Fast and Furious franchise that just are like, no, I will not accept this. Because I know you kind of have your beef for them. I get it. Um, but even you're like, oh, it actually holds up. It's not that yeah. bad. I don't like Vin Diesel as a person or as a performer, but I'm still going to evaluate his films fairly. You know, I I still love the Iron Giant and the Pacifier isn't amazing, but, you know, it's a pretty decent remake of Kindergarten Cop. (laughs) Uh, Here's the critics consensus. Vin Diesel parodies his tough guy image for the family audience, but the result is only moderately amusing. Uh, How how was it? Oh, just moderately amusing. (laughs) Oh, you sound fun. (laughs) It sounds like those type of dudes that just like they they just like do those soft claps. They can barely hear. They're just like, yes, bravo. It's that or the jazz snap clap. Oh God, kill me if you do if you do a jazz snap clap. Fuck you, man. <laughs> you pretentious asshole. <laughs> oh yeah, but uh, I'll just figure me away. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I don't think the pacifier is you know amazing, but I think he has done considerably worse. I think. If you want, you know, 90 minutes of, you know, acceptable entertainment, you could do worse. <laughs> if you want to watch Bad Vin Diesel, go watch like Babylon AD or something, um, which I have. I saw that shit in the theaters and it was bad. Um, yeah, like, look, and, you know, like, like how I know we were talking about before we recorded, but like, th- I look, this is a film that like, I remember I liked it when I saw it when it came out. And when we, I picked it for this, I was like, let me give it another shot here. And yeah, I'm with you. Like, no, it's not amazing, but it's not something I would be. If I I want to be opposed to putting on. It was an easy, amusing, more than moderately, yeah. <laughs> amusing, fun, ninety minutes of my life that I was like, you know what? I'd go back and watch this again for sure. Like, I, I wish you said there's plenty of most in the film that made me laugh pretty good. In the surprisingly hefty subgenre of giant action star has to deal with children, this is one of the better ones, I'd say. There's way more than you would think. 
Yeah, they, I mean, they made a sequel to King Kong Cop with Dolph, uh, Dolph Logan, so. Yeah, there's the spy next door with Jackie Chan. There's the game plan with Dwayne Johnson. You know, most of these done by Disney. Um, <laughs> yeah, they've monopolized this one. Thank God. Yeah, um, which does, uh, I think, bring me to an interesting question. So as you know, Disney in recent years, when it kind of comes to, I would say, the live action output has been mainly 99% either a remake of a cartoon, of a classic cartoon of theirs, or, you know, we got to get that next Pirates of the Caribbean. It's based off on their theme park rides. Before Pirates came out, before they were so focused on this, as we kind of started in the year, we got more varied, like, live action stuff. Like, it was family-friendly, but live action tended to be kind of, to me, along the time, just, like, easy. You sit off, turn your brain, and enjoy. With that said, what are your thoughts on the this type of live action Disney film, as opposed to kind of what we get now from them all the time in the live action department. I think that Disney has stopped taking chances in the past decade. I think that there was a time where you got a good balance of creative cartoons for children and then kind of odd duck live action films that stood out and we haven't gotten that in a long time. And I wonder, I think a lot of that can be blamed on 2012's John Carter. Uh, That film tanked hard. And I think it with, with Disney, you know, at the time they owned Marvel, they were about to acquire star Wars. I think they just didn't think it was worth it anymore. Just, you know, like, why bother when we've got all this surefire money going? Like, why bother? And that's a shame. I think Disney being, you know, the monopoly that they are could really kind of take the risks that other studios can't afford to take. And I would love to see them try that more often. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this, maybe Bob Chapik would be the guy who takes Disney in a new direction, but probably not. Yeah, I'm I'm with you because before this, there's plenty of like live action. Is like um this movie. Remember the remember the Titans, right? Yeah. Films like that. Then I'm like, you know, they they took risks. They did stuff with it, and they kind of like you could tell the the with the live action stuff it was meant as like like you said, like yeah, the MA film was it's still meant for families, but obviously target audience is uh your children. Whereas these these live action films, the target audience was the entire family. This is something the whole family can go and enjoy. Yeah. Um, like I remember like George of the Jungle was goofy but funny uh i know it was a remake but their 2003 version of freaky friday i thought held up same with the parent trap yeah um uh, yeah they had some good ones i mean you know on on the Disney yeah, before channel, that, had, yeah i was gonna say before that because again they like you said and you touched on they were they were willing to experiment with the live action stuff um i know it's an understated one but i highly recommend watcher in the woods mm. it's like their foray into horror and it's fucking it's a good goddamn movie such a good movie i think their live action masterpiece is national treasure i think that movie like national treasure yeah that movie's great that movie introduced an entire generation to like american history myself included uh you know honey i shrunk the kids holes like they had good stuff coming out and then just out of the blue they just put everything on remakes superhero movies and star wars yeah, and like I said, I, I try to separate the Star Wars and the, the superhero films because that's studios they acquired. Yes, it's obviously Disney, but they are more of like, hey, you do your thing, just keep us making keep making us money, we'll leave you alone. Um at least from MCU, it's worked out great for them. Same can't be said for Star Wars films. Um but yeah, it's like and don't get me wrong, like I'm not trying to like you know, for anyone comes at me on Pirates of Care Man, I love the original Pirates of Caribbean. I highly enjoy the first, the trilogy, five. Uh, but you know, I'm 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 in. I, I love it. But when it came out and became the huge hit, it did and became the big. I mean, box office phenomenon that they were not expecting because I think it had a pretty troubled production. For it took them a while to get that film out. Oh, dude! Um, like they didn't even like Johnny Depp completely like improvised his whole Jack Sparrow thing. They were like, "This is stupid. You're the reason this is going to fail." And everybody loved Jack Sparrow. Yeah. So like this, it was, it seemed doomed and then it became a hit. And like I said, that became the first thing of like, oh, okay, now we're just going to keep, because then they tried doing Lone Ranger and it's like, 
I know they're reattempting Haunted Mansion again. Um, they just that they get focused on that, and then yeah, like we said, all of a sudden they're like someone somewhere in that company. Hey, I want to take our cartoons and just make them live action, and no one said no, <laughs> and that's all they've been doing now. Yeah, but you know, if, if those hadn't been like billion dollar successes, they might have considered you know a new a new uh direction but it's it's really it's all it's our fault because we're you know it's just, we're the ones seeing these movies we're the ones making these movies billion dollar successes we're the ones telling disney give us more of this you know shapeless gruel we're gonna keep eating it i mean look i haven't seen any of the live action uh, re- uh cartoon remakes um, i have i have not seen a single one in theaters i've seen in theaters i saw alice in wonderland the Jungle Book, Dumbo, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. <laughs> yeah, I think you I saw bastard. all of them. You bastard. Yeah, I have I'm well out. aware I'm, I'm part of the problem. One. I haven't seen a single one in theater, so I'm not part of the problem. Um, I will say, um, I have hope in the sense with Disney+. Plus. It does seem that they are starting to want to experiment on there. I would say it's varied, their success rate. I know a lot of people do not like the recent Home Alone. There's another one right there, right? They did Home Alone, um, Santa Claus with Tim Allen, right? Um, Home Alone was originally, I don't think, was a Disney movie originally. I think that's something they acquired when they got 20th Century Fox. That's right. Yeah, I forgot they acquired that. Um, they did do Santa Claus. So I do remember that. That was them. That right? Was, yeah. yeah. So, you know, they got, I know they got another one with Tim Allen that's coming out on Disney+. Plus. Um, obviously we were just talking about before we recorded Hocus Pocus 2 is coming out now. It's for real, it's happening. So I and there I heard, you know, they got Rick Moranis out of retirement or whatever to do this new honey I shrunk the kids thing. So I have hope that somehow maybe we can get that experimentation again at the very least on Disney Plus. Um and that the quality is at least decent at the very least. So I'm I'm, I'm hopeful there. We'll just see how it shapes again right now on Disney Plus admittedly it's primarily i know for me used for star wars and mcu shows because all that shit's canon and i don't want to miss anything yeah that's why i pretty much use it but also you know i do like having on hand a vast catalog of disney films like their catalog really is impressive what they've got on there and you know there's a lot of films i haven't seen since i was a kid or i've never seen so it's nice getting to watch those from time to time yeah so but yeah so why do limit Name it, however you want to say it, the days of this type of live action film from Disney. It's like you said, it's like I always say, really, I've said it before without times. Like at the end, they're listening to what is making money. They're listening to the audience because audience responds by money. So if like considering this made 150 million, yes, huge box office success at its time. But now you have their films, like they come out with Lion King, they barely try and it makes a billion dollars. So they're like, well, shit, we can just keep doing this. Not even try. People want to fucking see it anyway. I, I get <laughs> it. It's a business. Like, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, there was a scene on The Boys where Homelander's like smiling and waving at the crowd, and he's mumbling under his breath, like "You cocksuckers." <laughs> just that's Disney. He's like, they didn't care about you as long as you're, you know, keeping the bottom line secure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as long as you're. Getting them that money, they need to keep going. <laughs> the, the fact that they're at a point where like they can write off like a fucking five hundred million dollar loss on a film or something, they're just like, whatever. We got like at least five billion dollars billion dollar grocers in the bag coming out, so it's fine. Yeah, it's like you know, if I think Dumbo didn't do very well, but you know, that same year, what was Avengers Endgame? So like they don't fucking care. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> Ah, well, with that, let's go ahead and get into our development hill. Um, so with this one, again, I had no another week where there was almost nothing, but I didn't want to do another top five uh, list so soon. So thank you, IMDb, here for what I was able to get. Um, so starting at the beginning, you know, as I said earlier, around this time, Vin Diesel wasn't just Mr. Fast and Furious or Groot. He was Vin Diesel. He was a, he was becoming a hot commodity. You know, he had the box office success of films like Pitch Black, Triple X, and the original Fast and the Furious. 
So he was a, hey, look out for this guy type of thing. Like, we have a new action star on our hands. Disney seemed to notice this because they were looking for a big action, big name action star for their upcoming film, Pacifier. But this is where it gets interesting. He was not their first choice. He was actually almost damn near dead last. Um, As Vin Diesel often is. Yeah. <laughs> so here we go. I want I want to name these actors, and I can't wait to see your face because I could see almost all these in this movie. One of which you know me enough, I would love to have seen in this fucking film. So these were the people that they considered before him. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson. What do you know? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting how he's that, still first. Obviously, that would work. That would absolutely work. Keep this one in mind, people. This was before he was diagnosed for a certain something and he cared about his acting. Bruce fucking Willis. Mm, 2005 Bruce Willis. No, I don't see it. I'd be down. 2005 Bruce Willis. He still had it in him in 2005. Host- hostage Willis, as I call him. I like hostage. I just with kids though. I just don't see him being like you know, simp- like sympathetic to children. <laughs> I know that's horrible, but I just can't see it. <laughs> he has like five daughters. Wow. I guess like the sixth sense, kind of, and like the kid. I don't know. Just I feel like he would kill these children before he'd like. He, they would drive him insane. I could see him as like a. a- a, a long career um, Navy SEAL, though. I can see that. Maybe it's the bad guy. Oh, that would be interesting. Um, that would be interesting. Okay. Uh, the next one, and imagine how this guy's career would have gone had he, had he gotten this, potentially. The staff himself, Jason Statham. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Statham. Yeah, I can see that. I think... I, this would have opened up a whole new bunch of doors for him, I think, actually. This would have been, he might have been a Disney Disney guy. <laughs> right? I Look, do you know how much I love Jason Statham in his movies? I would have fucking killed to have seen a version of this film with him as the lead. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially after seeing Spy, because he could have just brought the same energy from Spy into this film, and it would have worked just as well. If this had Statham and was rated R, this would be one of the greatest movies of all time. <laughs> Let's straight up. <laughs> but who knows? You know, I mean, <laughs> if Statham had taken this, maybe he'd be Groot. Like, who knows? Right? I mean, like, I mean, his crew's gone great. I mean, you could argue, you know, he's attached to the Fast and Furious franchise. Um, he had spy right. He's had his mainstream success for sure, but God, I would have of all of them. I would have really. And honestly, Dwayne Johnson would have been a great pick too. He would, especially like a early, very hungry to do different stuff for Dwayne Johnson. Um, not in any way pointing down him now as an actor. I, I very much so love him as an actor. Um, apart, from, but, apart from Bruce Willis, is there anybody who wasn't connected to the Fast and Furious franchise who was considered for this? Uh, a member of the Funky Bunch himself, Marky Mark. Mark Wahlberg. Oh my God. No, no way. 2005 Mark Wahlberg. (laughs) I don't see a year later he does The Departed. Like, I don't see Mark Wahlberg as. Can you imagine if, like, he did this? We would not have had him in The Departed properly. Oh, no, fuck that. (laughs) He's the funniest part of The Departed. Uh, But yeah, that's based off off seeing him, things like the other guys. I think he would have been fine in this. I think he would have actually probably out of all of them would have been able to sell the comedy the best because he is really good at comedy. I I agree with that. I don't think I, he would have been able to pull off the the uh, sound of music production part because I just I feel like if he finds out you know the kids do it in a musical theater and wants to quit the wrestling team, I, something about Mark Wahlberg I feel like he'd be pissed off. Don't you remember he learned how to dance? To get back at her and her, you don't think I can do this shit? <laughs> <laughs> Great movie. And All right, and then last but not least, and this is going to be most interesting because there is more to this one. Um, the at the time, again, remember guys, two thousand five. 
Shaka Chan. They made that happened. <laughs> like five years later, Chan did a movie called The Spy Next Door that is like exactly this. So clearly people were still thinking about it. Well, that's why I said there's more <laughs> to this one, to Jackie Chan. And it's not because it's by next door. He was actually originally attached to the film. He was, a re- he, out of all of them, was actually attached. And this is why, I don't know why they didn't just take it out. Uh, this is why the film still has ninjas, because they were people from his stunt team. <laughs> they just oh, didn't boy. take them out. And also the duck. The duck was a leftover from when he was in the movie. What? Did, he ready, requ- did he request the duck? Nope, you ready to go down a racist route? Because we're doing it. Oh, uh, there was going to be a running joke where Jan- well, he was going to attempt to kill and cook the duck for dinner before reluctantly keeping it and taking care of it. What the fuck? I probably that- I should have put like a trigger warning before that, but yeah, the uh, racist joke now and coming 2005 man when that was just perfectly acceptable but disney's like hey let's get jackie chan and do a duck j- joke because you know chinese love ducks what the fuck man yeah and, and chan was okay with that he was like let's do this yeah he was okay they actually did not say i could not find out why he had to leave but it had nothing to do with the duck <laughs> i'm trying to think of what chan's like immediate next project was and i think it was rush hour three that could have been why he left. He had to go do Rush Hour. Because like, I'm sure they probably had a contract on that. Like, no, because technically, believe it or not, Lee Sean, because this was pre-MCU, pre-Star Wars, you could get away bulldozing Disney a bit. And I'm sure at that point, you could have pulled the, no, we have him under contract. Fuck off, Disney. We want Jackie Chan. My God, can you imagine New Line standing up to Disney in 2005? Like, no, we own him first. Back off, mouse. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, you gotta remember, it was before that. Now it's it's probably a terrifying ideal because they bought Fox just to have X Men. Um, That's funny. I I think it's interesting that like clearly Jackie Chan did not like he wanted to do a spy movie, so he just waited. (laughs) He just finished Rush Hour Three, and I was like, "Hey guys, I'm I'm done now." (laughs) <laughs> that's funny but you know vin was available and now we know why he didn't do too fast too furious <laughs> i ain't got no choice oh god i had to get that out of my system toretto has got a twin brother who's a navy seal oh god damn it no the cannon this is part of the fast and the furious diesel verse <laughs> was one point Toretto was abducted by aliens they acquired his DNA they spliced it with a tree Groot you know what's sad with the way the Fast Fish franchise is going that's not out of the realm possibility anymore <laughs> it's fucking crazy it's just he's he's pretty much the same guy in every single movie but you know what he's not the only one so many action guys yeah. especially get away with that yeah and and again I'll, you know, I know, like we were saying, like now it bugs me because you watch, like, watch, like, you watch, like, before Fast Furious was like what it is now when he was first in it, like that first film. He's, he has emotion. He is actually trying. He is fucking acting for once compared to like, and that's what bugs me because you watch like his newer stuff and it's like the dude just sleepwalk his way through every fucking film he's in. Mine is screwed. For some reason, he really gave it his all for three fucking lines of dialogue. Well, when I mean, you know, when you've got let's let's say you're a carpenter and you've got to, you know, redo an entire house. It's daunting, you know, once you once you're halfway through it and maybe if you're, if you're not a very good carpenter, you're probably like, oh, just get this over with. But if all you got to do is build a doghouse, <laughs> you might see like I'm gonna make this best goddamn doghouse anyone's ever seen because all I got to do is build a doghouse. So I bet. There's a little bit of that in Vin Diesel. Like, all I got to do is say, I am Groot 16 different times. Buckle up. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be great. <laughs> but it's just, it bugs me, right? Because, like, even then, like, during this period of, like, this movie and, you know, Triple X, the first Fast and Furious, you know, Pitch Black. And I think at the time, Chronicles of Reddick had already come out. Um, 
you know, because he was still young in his career, because he was still always having to try and prove himself, he was trying. And that's been my thing always. Like, okay, The Rock. The Rock's by no means, like, he's by no means an Academy Award, like, great actor. But God damn it, if he doesn't have, like, charm and charisma out the ass, and he's so fun to watch, that's like, no, you can be limited in your acting abilities by all means. As long as you're trying, as long as you bring something to the table, and that's why I, I sometimes I like, or I say I defend his early career of indie souls because he is trying. He is actually like you can tell in his performances he's trying, even if his range is limited. He's actually doing his best that he can. Yeah, I mean, take take for example, you know, one of the highest grossing box office stars of all time, Arnold Schwarzenegger, not the greatest actor, pretty by the numbers, pretty you know empty in performance but god damn if he doesn't bring it he's a movie star straight you know through and through and his films are memorable because he understood that and i think vin diesel still thinks he's a great actor i i that's what i think from what i understand things i've heard about how he is on set i feel like ego's gotten the best of him in recent years especially with the money fast furious bringing home every time that it's like he it's like yeah he forgot how to just at the very least try but in his head he thinks he's still giving like great eight performances when he just randomly randomly yells i ain't got no choice yeah it's actually kind of sad i mean he's being upstaged by dwayne johnson and john cena like damn man <laughs> yeah and it's like dude you've kind of been in the game the acting game at least longer because, you know, I know Dwayne, he's around the same age as Dwayne Johnson, but, you know, he wrestled first before he switched over to acting. Um, so it's like, you've been in this game longer. You're like, you know this business more than they do. Like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. The damn shame. It is also just like, I don't know, God's sense of humor that a guy named Vin Diesel became like the face of a car-based action franchise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think about then, that all the time. I'm like, what are the fucking odds? Yep. I mean, as he keeps cock teasing us for a fourth break film that I've just lost hope that I'm getting now at this point. <sighs> yeah. No, Which I, and again, that's another thing, right? So, like, I, I know you're not a big fan of Pitch Black, but you can't deny that, like, he himself is really good in that in that film. Yeah. Because he, I think he's good as Dick Riddick. I agree. <laughs> and it, what, I, what I hate is remember when I when I went to go see the third film. Uh, Riddick, just simply talk to Riddick. Um, he was bringing it. I remember Simmer going, So you do have it in you, jackass. Like, you can still do it because you, I, he loves the Riddick character. So he's always, he always brings it when it comes to that character. So I'm like, You can do it. So why the fuck do you just opt for everything? And not just Fast and Furious. I've seen the shit he's tried to do outside of that, like that blood sport shit. And I'm like, No, you're literally doing this for every fucking film you do. You don't try. But then you do Riddick and you're like, oh no, I'm going to try. And it's like, it is in you. It's still in you. Just fucking use it more often. Maybe don't be a dick and you'll get more film roles, bud. That's that's the golden rule, isn't it? Don't be a dick and you get more offers. Yeah. Hell, even um, when I saw the new Triple X, the return of Xander Cage, I'm like, again, he's trying. Look at that. Like it, it just it's annoying. It's like that's all I'm asking, man. It's all I'm asking. Like, I, I know you're limited. Just try. <laughs> When I saw the poster for that, I've never seen any of the Triple X movies. So my first thought was, who the hell is Xander Cage? You know what's funny? That's the third film when he put that on there. The first one has him, you know, the first Triple X, he's in it. And it's actually it's 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 not a bad movie. I actually really enjoy it. It's a it's a fun action flick. Uh the second one sucks. It has Ice Cube in it, and like he's trying, but the film's fucking terrible. Scott Speedman's in it. Uh huh. And <laughs> And then we were both he, just like, oh, of course, then, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. No offense to Scott Spielberg, but and I love the Underworld films, but he is not the best part of the Underworld films. Um, which is funny because he's actually one of like the biggest hinges plot wise of like the first two movies. Um, and then yeah, they did the third one where Vin Diesel was like, yeah, I'm coming back, I'm doing the third thing, you know, I'm bringing back Triple X, so that's why they called it that Triple X Return of Xander Cage, and then. Like Riddick, he has he keeps teasing that a new one's gonna come out, but won't fucking do it. See, but I'd argue that Triple X isn't exactly on you know in the public consciousness as a like super memorable action film that everybody remembers. You know, 
He's not John Rambo. <laughs> like, who the fuck? If you've never seen the movie, you don't know who the hell Xander Cage is. I think that's a very presumptuous title. <laughs> like, guess who's back? Who? I don't fucking know who this is. <laughs> guess who's back, 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 back again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, well, again, what's funny is that that and Riddick both made money at the box office, and he is fucking cock teased for years a fourth Riddick and a fourth triple X. But then he's like, well, I still got to do like the 10th. I'm like, I don't, I was like, dude, you have time between films and don't try to pull the, well, I got to do stuff for Groot. You say three lines of dialogue. You could record it, send it to them and you're done. Like what, how, that does not require that much for your day. I get the feeling like he's blackmailing people. He's like, you want a, a fourth Riddick movie and a fourth triple X? I want asses and seats for fast 10. So what's good? How's it going to happen? <laughs> what's good? What's going to happen? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you're not getting any younger. Like you're in your fifties now. Like eventually it's gonna look weird you trying to be Riddick. They do like an old man Riddick. At this point, that's that's all we can hope for. <laughs> What's funny too is that to do this new Riddick, they would have to get Carl Urban back too. He was very happy with the voice right now. Do we need I don't even remember what his character was. Those Riddick movies are so fucking weird. He he was uh Vanko Vanko said in the in the second movie. He had a fucking like he had a ponytail because he was like he was young. He was like 20 something year old car urban. It's so it's like you've got Vin Diesel's fucking D D campaign sandwiched between two by the numbers horror films. <laughs> like how did that happen? <laughs> Are you trying to say something about pitch black? Because I fucking love pitch black. No, pitch black is a straightforward horror film. Riddick, straightforward horror film. And in the middle, you got the Chronicles of Riddick, which is this crazy space hopper that no one fucking understands. <laughs> no, I actually, yeah, I, I would have to look at that, but I think it's a mixture of him or the development and then like the studio want to make it more than what it was because they're like, oh, people really like pitch black. Like, well, we didn't like that you just made every other sci fi film with the sequel. <laughs> yeah, you know what people really loved about pitch black? the space politics and then somebody would be like what space politics and they'd be shut up like that's that's you know that's people, the pitch you know what you know what people really wanted a pg-13 they were like eh, ours too much let's make this pg-13 clearly they didn't know who he was fucking with because you do not know the vibe is all wrong <laughs> yeah we'll we'll go back to riddick at some point on one of these shows i know chronicles is in our potential list for this show for this one yeah but, riddick i would save that for film guys it's actually got decently reviewed and was a decent success yeah but, you know, um, I'm, I'm down to watch that one again but honestly i don't know if i could stomach chronicles again <laughs> chronicles is yeah it's something <laughs> um but yeah now with that i drive like what i wish Vin Diesel would give us Vin, just try. Just please go back to this era and try in your performances. <sighs> was it uh real quick? I heard like Charlie's Theron kind of dissed him a bit because uh they it was like who's one of the worst uh kissers you've had on screen with you? And she was like Vin Diesel. <laughs> damn, like no, no chill, no hesitation. <laughs> like, damn, man. Yeah. Yeah, her response was like she's like she's like, I like it when uh my men get a little more involved because apparently you just stood there. <laughs> Like, yep, kiss these lips. If you are gonna be in a movie where you're gonna kiss Charlize Theron, how do you not get into it? You have to tell me to stop giving her tongue. Like the baby, come down, come down, come down, come down over there. I <laughs> would get I'd get that scene wrong so many times on purpose. Right? I what was it? Have you seen uh Rhythm Millers? Yes. The scene when he has to kiss fucking Emma Roberts and Jim Ryan, I'd be like, dude, I'd be messing that scene up so many times. You're like, oh shit, my bad. Funny side note: uh, Jamie Lee Curtis uh, was asked once, uh, "Who's the best kiss she ever had in a movie?" And I, you're, the answer may surprise you. Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, Trading Places. <laughs> Apparently, that dude knows how to kiss. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just love that. In that moment, I feel like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like got soft like he might have been hard at the time it's that 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 happened went soft immediately and he had no idea why (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh. He doesn't have a lot of experience, man. He doesn't really kiss a lot on the screen. Good old Arnie. I mean, he was like, he was Mr. Universe. I'm sure he got a lot of practice off screen. Based <laughs> stuff, various allegations. He definitely had practice. Uh, for those who remember his past, when he was trying to become a uh, governor. With that said, do I still love Schwarzenegger films? Hell yeah, I do. Um, well. well, on that note, <laughs> Um, even uh, going back to this, so even when, even though, like I said, you know, Jackie Chan eventually left the project. Again, I couldn't find why, but I'm sure it probably has something to do with Rush Hour 3 at the time. Um, other writers came on, and for whatever reason, they said, hey, let's just keep the duck. Let's just duck keep and the them. ninjas, keep them. Yeah, it's just an eccentric thing, and somehow it's never really established in the movie the relationship between Vin Diesel and this duck, but at the end, the duck totally listens to him. Yeah, it's yeah, the duck stayed and then the ninjas, so they, they didn't probably change any of that, which is North funny because the ninjas, ninjas. yeah, the ninjas would probably destroy a navy seal. I'm just saying, um, <laughs> they're faster, navy seals just know how to fight in a brute force. Um, ninjas actually have speed and nimbleness to them, yeah, um, firing a gun also helps. That's true. That if they so do, do have guns, and that will help them. But this is a Disney film. He actually never has a gun. <laughs> um, but as you can tell in the finished pro, pro, uh, product, Diesel would be cast in what would be at the time his first leading role in a comedy in a Disney film. Again, at the time, because as we all know, he is now attached to the MCU. So now he's in Disney again. And I want to say he technically could argue that's comedy too, because Guardians of the Galaxy does involve a lot of comedy. I classify them as comedies, but not really him, because he's just saying I am Groot. He's not well, he's not a leading role, but he is with Disney again. True. True. Um, true. But at the time, this was like his first thing. So that's why I say like at the time, probably I would say pretty significant for his career because this was the the hot new action star doing a family friendly film. You know what I mean? Not that like you could theoretically probably watch Fast and Furious and Triple X with your family are PG-13, but even then I know there's like the whole PG-13 sauciness of uh, Agia Argento um, in it when she beds him at one point in the movie and Fast and Furious has all the skimpy clothing you know, women and yeah, yeah, this was family film yep, family film here <laughs> I was saying, I was like, yeah, no, they got some if your kids are too young, you probably don't want them to see certain things and probably the female body <laughs> and those two films and Riddick was rated R at the time. So, yeah, I think, I think, you know, go full bore, show your kids pitch black and then, you know, explain to them like, this is Vin Diesel. This is Groot. This is who he really is. I mean, I would do that if I had kids. You know me though. Yeah. I can't wait to uh, find it. When you have kids, I can't wait to hear how that goes. Because <laughs> I know you. You're gonna you're gonna try to go, you know, hocus pocus, Halloween Town, a little soft, but you're gonna get ahead of yourself and you're gonna like jump right into like Elm Street or something, and it's gonna yeah. be great. Oh, you guys really like hocus pocus? All right, let's try out Saw. What do you guys say? <laughs> I imagine like we do the Zoom and I can just hear your kid crying in the background, and you're like, I got something to tell you. <laughs> so I put it on Hostel. I thought it'd be a good idea. <laughs> Of course, if you go super hard, they won't get scared by anything else. That is true, too. So you're saying I should just go straight into the sadness and just hope for the best. <laughs> Maybe teach them right and wrong first and then <laughs> and then work your way up to that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, that's tough. I, I can't imagine, like, where you got to, you know, how do you, how do, you do that? Yeah. My, my, my parents are just like, here's a stack of tapes. Enjoy. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll see one day if that ever happens in my life. So, um, as far as the production, the only thing I really got is that um, they did have an actual Navy SEAL on the set for authenticity. Um, as I, I, I don't, uh, I was talking about it for the most part. I, I, in case anyone doesn't know at this point, I'm in the Navy still. Uh, Josh is also in the Navy, I'm not a SEAL. I'm not in shape to be that. But I am in the Navy. And even I was like, they're 
for the most part, more authentic than I've seen in other films. Um, for the most part, um, with that, I mean, there's so obviously some quibbles for for me. Like, first off, you're not uh, the white t-shirt he keeps running throughout the film would not be okay. It's considered a part of um, what the Navy would call underwear because our dress uniforms we have to wear a white t-shirt under it. So you, that's how you see the white when we wear our dress blues, our dress whites. You see in pictures. Um, so you're not supposed to wear it just as a shirt out and about. It, it's way out of ranks. Um, and the Navy SEAL especially would not do that because they are very gung-ho about stuff like that. Um, also, Lauren Graham, she said she was a third class. I think at one point, and he's a lieutenant. At one point, he like insinuates that she's higher ranked than him, and that's not the case at all. Not even if they're on land? Yeah. Because that's what he third, said. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, he was wrong. A third class is like the low end of the totem pole. And the, uh, he's like a lieutenant, which is a low end of officers, but it's above me. I'm a second class, so I'm one rank above third. And then a, a lieutenant's way above me. That's an officer. I have to salute to them. Put it like that. I'm supposed to, they're an officer. I have to salute them when I see them out outside. Gotcha. Well, I mean, this is a Disney movie about a Navy SEAL being a <laughs> manny. So authenticity is probably pretty low on the priority list. Yeah. But with that said, I'm impressed with what they did. I was like, okay, I'm kind of impressed with your plot that you actually even try to be remotely authentic. So good job. Oh, and also he would not have that computer he was using, would not have that at the house. Dear God, would he be in fucking jail so quick? Because that's like a top secret type stuff he's looking at out in the fucking public. Not okay. Well, also, I imagine using your Navy SEAL training to humiliate and beat the shit out of a gym teacher. Also, probably not okay. Probably, not okay, but you could probably get away with that, depending. <laughs> the computer thing would send you to jail. Like I, my job involves secret stuff, and I'm I cannot take it outside of the building I work at, or even out of the section of the building I work at. Well, I imagine there was also like probably some leeway because this was a high priority. You know, we got to find this chip, do whatever you need to do, kind of thing. Or maybe not. No. Kind of. No. Secret, secret. It's like you it has to be in this area and this area only. If you leave outside of it, it's a security breach. And uh, good luck trying to explain that one. Well, I'm a civilian. <laughs> All I know about military secrets is what I get from movies. So, Fair enough. that's a fire. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, oh, literally, other than those, we did a pretty good, pretty good job. I was impressed. Um, like I said, uh, the, the film would get released um, to pretty good box office success, but critical hate critics just were moderately amused as whatever the fuck that means, as they said. Did you laugh or not? Was it funny or not? Yeah, like I was mo- what you chuckled once or twice. Like, what does that even mean? Ha. Huh. Funny. Ugh. I would like just an obnoxious critic. Just- Ha 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 ha! Just like that throughout the movie. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, I don't get it. I don't get some people like you can admit you liked the Vin Diesel movie where he played a manny. It's there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, people! I I love the sadness. One of the most fucked up films of the year. And I also enjoyed watching this. Two, two opposite ends of the spectrum. It, you got to be honest with yourself about the kinds of films you like. Otherwise, you're just, what's the term? Moderately amusing. <laughs> so, yeah. Honesty is always the best policy. <laughs> Damn it. <sighs> well, well, it has well, it does seem this one's forgotten except now that we're talking about it. Um, supposedly, like I've kind of mentioned with so many other fucking films that aren't fast and furious with diesel. He claimed in December 2015 that a sequel is being written, and I haven't, of course, like I said with his other fucking films, we haven't heard anything since. So is it coming out? Probably not. He wants to finish fast and fucking furious first. Plenty of time for Bloodshot, The Last Witch Hunter, all this shit. Plenty of time for that. It's amazing. It's like he's allergic 
to the idea of like, hey, this was really successful and people liked you in it. You want to do another one? Uh, I, mm, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's weird. It is weird. But also, I don't think we need a sequel to The Pacifier. I was not really wondering, like, what is Shane Wolf going to do next? Yeah. And like, yeah, that's thing. Like, what would you do? Would you have it be like that same family? Because that's our thing. Like, all these actors, like, a lot. If you guys didn't notice, they are some big name actors. Now you got Britney Snow, Max Theory. Like a lot of these guys are gone on to do some pretty big stuff. I think Max Theory is on a Navy SEAL coincidence on a fucking Navy SEAL show, <laughs> playing a SEAL. So hey, there you go there. And then you know Britney Snow re- recently did X. She's usually popping up and stuff all the time. So like a lot of these these guys these kids grew up to be like you know actors that are consistently working. No, yeah. well the film ends with him like retiring to be the new wrestling coach and hook up with the Gilmore girls chick. So that's, that's it really. I mean, there's nothing, yeah. else, nowhere else to go. go. Which uh, fun fact, she was uh Lauren Graham, I think was the first uh, MILF I ever, or person I recognized as a MILF. Cause I had the biggest crush on her when I I'd never, no one in my family watched Gilmore girls. I would just see the damn trailer for it. And then she popped up in movies like bad Santa and stuff. And I was like, She's hot, and so I think that was like my first official like crush on like a milf, if you will, even though it was completely a fictional one because <laughs> she's not a mom in real life. Of what you will just randomly divulge during the show, yeah. I'm so, pr- I'm so proud of you. Open, honest. You said it. Honesty is the best policy. Fuck you. True. It's true. Honestly, I can't remember my first milf crush. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, Lauren Graham. There it was. I'm saying I said it. Well done, I guess. I, I don't know what yeah. to say. <laughs> you know, she was almost cast in Scream 4. Is who? She's gonna be like Nev's uh Nev Camel's aunt. She was supposed to be the aunt role. Oh. Hmm. Okay. I think she was almost cast or got cast and backed out. I don't know what happened. I just, I just remember being going like, oh hey. Hello, Lauren Graham. And then they were like, no, she's not anymore. I was like, oh, okay. Well, there's always oh. six. There's always six cream. So this is true. Update on that. Rumors are swirling that supposedly Nev Camel is renegotiating that. Honestly, yeah, I think you're toxic, but I, I don't give a shit anymore. Just go, Nev. You don't need this. Just go. <laughs> you're better than this, Nev. You're better than this. Honestly, I just don't think we need her in the movie. Like, how many times? Is Sydney Prescott going to be targeted by some ghost faced dude who has something to do with her fucking mom? Like, how many times are we going to do this? Oh, mom did a lot of damage. <laughs> Six times. That's how many. <laughs> Possibly seven. There's rumors already strong. Did you have a plan, <laughs> a plan for a seventh film? Uh, seven Cream. Uh, apparently, Five Cream was like the start of this new trilogy. I like these movies. Starting to think we're biting off more than we could chew here, but we'll see. We'll see. I didn't really like the new. I've hoped for Scream Six that they're calling Scream Six, which kind of pisses me off because they just called the new one Scream. <laughs> uh, scream, Scream Two, Scream Three, Scream again, Scream Six. Fuck you! It's just got five. <laughs> Nothing compared to the Fast and Furious. Oh and their, God! Their title, title disasters. The Fast and Furious, Too Fast, Too Furious, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift, Fast and Furious, drop the the, Fast Five, Furious Six, no, sorry, Fast Six, Fast and Furious Six, it was so fucking, they had so many title changes for that one, Fast and Furious Six, Furious Seven, The Fate of the Furious, F9, The Fast Saga, Fast X, as I'm calling it. Don't forget Fast and Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw. They they don't like to act like that one exists, unless you're does. It made quite a lot of money because people like Dwayne Johnson and Jason Statham. And, <laughs> and Idris Elba. <laughs> and Idris Elba. And Vanessa Kirby. People like her, too. Yeah, you know people don't really I... like that much these days? Vin Diesel. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, unless we have any more fun asides to make. <laughs> I'm good. Let's move on to the awards. And start off with the Zack Snyder 
worst scene. The what worst you got? scene. Um, well, I had to, you know, kind of reach here because there's not really a moment where I'm like, oh, because this isn't bad. Uh, ultimately, I just don't like hearing Vin Diesel sing. So I went with the uh, Peter Panda dance. The first time when he does it for Peter and he's singing it and doing the moves. And I'm like, I don't like him singing. It's weird. It's off putting. He, he's clearly not enjoying this. So I just, yeah, just made me uncomfortable. Yeah. It, I mean, I, it didn't bother me because I, I got why he didn't, because in character, yeah, he doesn't like the character, doesn't want to do it. He doesn't like it. But I'm like, like you, I know what mine it was the same deal. It was like, I really had to reach because there wasn't a scene that made me go, oh my God. You know what I mean? Like, we could have almost had that with Jackie Chan if they had done that fucking duck subplot. But that was thankfully removed minus the duck. Yeah. Yeah. We'd be talking about a much different situation here. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I just, there's something about Vin Diesel singing that is so off putting. It's like, just, uh, dude has no tone. What a surprise. Is there anything he can only, do? He can scream. He can yell as we've seen in movies. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. For mine, mine's something. It's it's a nitpick, really. And my, <coughs> I put the jumping into the sewer to go retrieve the tracker simply just for gross factor. Yeah. Like the moment he popped up, like I did like the punchline when he walks through the door and Lauren Graham's like, "Do you need anything?" And he just keeps going, "I'm fine." Are you sure I can get? I'm fine. <laughs> like that made me laugh, but actually seeing him jump in there and then come up with it, I was like, oh, that's kind of gross. Yeah. It's like he should have been able to figure out the fact, like, oh, they flushed it. Like, not they're in this, like, they're in the sewer being kidnapped. Like, he should have been able to yeah. figure it out. It was a little gross. I did like when he comes in, ha ha, and just holds it up. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised he didn't punch a few of them over that. Right. Yeah. I still laugh at that scene when he grabs the football and just squeezes it and just looks at the kid. Get out. <laughs> that was good. I, my, I loved it when they, when he catches the boyfriend the first time and he's like, like give me 20. And he takes out his wallet. <laughs> he's like, push-ups. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> I like when he tells the kids they have to clean. At the party, and the one kid tries running away, and the shit falls on him. And he's like, "This was my favorite shirt." We never do find out who the baloney guy was. No, but I did die. I, I so again authenticity. I died laughing when they were doing the cleaning because this has happened. I kid you not. This this actually happens in the United States Navy. We have think our cleaning stations. We have to clean for like an hour, about an hour, forty five minutes to an hour. It's on the ship, not sure what you think, but on the ships um that i hate because they take it so fucking seriously like it's it's like boot camp serious levels here um and uh the reason i laughed is because in the scene that they're cleaning vin diesel takes his fingers and wipes it across the table to look for dust they actually do that the amount of times for five years i was on uss and it was that that happened to me (laughs) that is a legit thing i wish i was joking it's i had so many higher ups that could tell I wasn't because I'm like, I do this every day. Fuck this. That would come by, wipe their fucking shitty ass fingers on something, go like, oh look, see, not clean, and show me the dust on their fingers. Mm. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. That, I, I I don't I don't like authority. So I, I I wouldn't do well in the military. Yeah. So I did I did get a good laugh. I was seeing that because that is I kid you know, that's for shit. They do that shit for real. So that <laughs> I don't know what that Silto Diesel weighs like. Hey, you should do this. <laughs> oh, uh, interesting but, scenes. Yeah, yeah. Um, with that, let's move on um, to the next one. The Ed Wood first line. Our lines. Yeah, again, just not a not, you know decent screenplay. I had to kind of write, reach for this too. Um, I went with hmm? same. Yeah. I went with an exchange between um, Julie, the mom, and uh, Captain Bill Fawcett, our secret bad guy. When uh, he reveals his true colors, ties them up, and she says, I trusted you. Howard trusted you. You betrayed us, and you betrayed your country. Like, ooh. And then he responds with, guess what? North Korea pays better. 
Like that's, that's it. That's your motivation for you're a captain in the Navy. You you're clearly a career soldier and North Korea offered a little bit more money. You completely throw everything away, your entire patriotism, yeah, that... your country, your family, your identity, everything. It's like, that's, that's shitty motivation. Yeah. As again, the Navy person here, there's no way in hell that's happening because North Korea will not pay nearly as much as the three of a fucking CEO of a captain in the United States Navy. They are making, they're, they're making like, I think like it's like six, no, it's more than six. They're making a shit done. Like they're making a lot of money a month alone. Yeah. And also, like, I don't know how many, you know, geopolitical people are out there, but North Korea, pretty fucking poor country. Like, not exactly it, known for being wealthy and, you know, making deals outside of the nation. Like, they're pretty self contained, poor, shitty, like, cult of a country. They're not reaching out to American naval captains and being like, hey, find this program we somehow found out about. Yeah, no, no, it's not plausible at all. And I just pulled it up because it was going to bug me. Um, okay. They can make anywhere on the low end, and this is a month, 7000 per month, low end, high end, 12000 Mm, it's pretty good <laughs> yeah but i mean even so, like even if it was even if they had you know somehow if they topped that he's still a career poli- like a career soldier who's not going to just throw away his entire i like all of his ideals for a little scratch yeah i've, I've never heard of a of someone that long in the military just throwing it all away no like pretty, that yeah and if correct me if I'm wrong, but did, did he seem kind of young to be a, a captain? He did he seem some captains do look young. Like sometimes they advance really, really fast if they're just like that into it and they, they know how to play the game. No. Um but most of the time they are all older and um especially the I've seen look man, I when I was on Nimitz, I had th- three captains when I was on that boat. And um, I didn't. I can't speak to him for on the first one because he was on his way out when I got to the boat. But the first two, they looked. They came in. They looked old as shit. And they're <laughs> in like the two to three years they were on that boat because they were so like it's such a stressful job because you're in charge of everything. Hmm. Like, yeah, he you just are your captain. You're CEO. See, he didn't seem like he had the weight of the world on his shoulders or anything like that. He just seemed like a dude wearing a costume. Yeah. Not, more on that later yeah no it, yeah no i'm with you it, the age is the age is possible i'll say that much. the age is possible okay it, you just don't see it often with captains usually yes they are older because they've usually you know have been in a long time okay uh, Fair enough. yeah uh, for mine, I had two and again they're like you said they're nitpicky ones um one's actually said by vin diesel at the very beginning and mainly because it's just it's corny. I don't know why they I don't know any seals are gonna fucking say this before a mission. And it's when he goes, We are seals, and this is what we do. I knew you were gonna have that. I, when I heard that line, I'm like, oh, he's not gonna like that. No, I didn't. I was like, look, if I was a seal, my like my fucking build or whatever they call them was saying, I'd be like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like <laughs> you sound like it. It just it, it sounds like something a screenwriter who doesn't really know anything about Navy SEALs would 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 say. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't think they say that at all. I, I feel like that was just put in there to, so we know, oh, okay, Navy SEALs, cool. It's not like a football huddle where they're like, go oh, SEALs. Like, that, they don't do that. They get the mission brief, they go do the mission, and they get the fuck out of there. Yeah, that's what they do. Because in case you don't know, I this is how much I this is what you well to put their job into perspective. You're not supposed to know about their missions, so they in 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 and out yeah. type you of stuff. These are the guys who took Bin Laden down. Like they know how to keep secrets. Yeah, and that was one of the few times that we knew what they were they what they were doing because that was such a high profile thing that was going on. Yeah. Um. 
my second one, and it, I, I put because it's just I did. I felt like why did you put the, it was a throwaway line that I was like you didn't really need this throwaway line, and it's when um it's after uh, Vin Diesel finds Seth at the fucking theater and sees him doing, and he drops the girl, and you know they have a big freak out and all that stuff, and randomly she comes up to him after the theater teacher had this moment to be like seriously Seth you dropped me again I'm going to kill you. I don't know why. I was like, did we really need that throwaway line? Like, was that necessary? <laughs> I nearly had the whole drama teacher freak out because it was so cliched. It was, you know, people, we open in a week. Like, it was the whole just, like, every fucking drama dude in every pop culture thing is always, like, a closeted or super open gay man who's just upset the whole time. <laughs> And yeah, even bringing up Bob Fosse, like he would have, you know, I'd bring him back just so he could have a heart attack again. Like, Jesus Christ, man. It's community theater yeah. sound of music. Let's relax. <laughs> it's not the big leagues here. You're in like the most cramped looking theater I've seen in my life. <laughs> and I've been to a small theater like that. That's how I saw the Evil Dead um, theater. It was at a small community one over in uh, Tacoma, Washington, um, that they were doing at that Evil Dead theater experience. And yeah. um, I still had a good time, but like, I mean, it wasn't like this big fucking theater you see in the movie. It was like a small cramped one like that. Yeah. It just was so over the top and ridiculous. And I was like, come on, man. But I'm glad you had something in that in that vein. Yeah. Yeah. It, like I said, it's just like, it was just a quick throw. And I was like, do we really need it? Like, you already had the big moment with the teacher and then and then you had Vin Diesel have his say, you know, talk with them. Like, was that really needed? We could have just moved on without her saying that, especially because it's like her only line of dialogue. <laughs> so I'm like, did the extra just get a little overzealous there? <laughs> <laughs> I need my moment. It happened. <laughs> I remember re watching an interview with Brad Pitt where he had his first ever uh, pro like uh, job and he was a, a, a waiter with no lines in some like movie of the week. And he was like, I got to get a line. Like, then people will see me. And he tried to sneak in a, you know, like, can I get you more water or something as a waiter? And the director was like, cut. What are you doing? <laughs> like, he was like, nothing. He's like, yeah, don't do that again. Let's go again. And he, he was like, I almost fucked my whole career because I tried to be a, a waiter. It was a really funny story. <laughs> oh, hey, look. If you're an extra, just be happier in a movie in some capacity. Like you, you're not going to compete with a big name star that's already attached to that film that is getting paid to say lines of dialogue. It's risky as shit. Like, just you know, it's not always going to work out. Like that guy from being John Malkovich, which is the funniest. You know that story? No. There's a there's a, lot, a scene in the movie where John Malkovich is like super depressed. He's walking down the street and some dude trucks past in a truck yelling hey Malkovich think fast and threw a fucking can at him and the can bounced off his head he was like fuck that was some extra being overzealous okay he wasn't supposed to throw the can and the can hit Malkovich and he was really like fuck and the director thought that was so goddamn funny he gave the guy a pay boost and left the movie and left the scene in the movie oh my god I just, some, it does not usually work out like that no, and I'm sure John Rockfish won't piss me anything that she got a can through at him. It's, it I would be, so be like, well. fuck. It's such a great moment, though. Like, I get why uh, Spike Jones was like, yeah, we're going to keep that. <laughs> oh, oh Spike Jones. <laughs> he's not doing a check. Yep. <laughs> he's really, he's an Oscar winning filmmaker who moonlights in the Jackass films. I'll never understand that, but I love it. Yeah, I love how they don't fuck with them. They'll fuck with uh, um, uh, Tremaine like all the time, but they leave Spike Jones alone. He's the money. <laughs> yeah, the case He's producing this money. shit. Like, you don't fuck with him. <laughs> Tremaine, though, he's like, ah, he's just a director. We'll get him. Uh, uh, my note. Um, now for the Steven Seagal, the worst performance. Um, again, I know you probably had, I know I had to reach, I know you probably had to reach, but what, what do you got? I have Chris Potter as Captain Bill Fawcett. Uh, I just think he's such a bland character. Like there's no, 
there's nothing to this guy. And then out of the blue, he's the bad guy. Like, no, I didn't buy it. Yeah. It, he, he gives up pain. The only guy to go do this. Yes, sir. Thank you for not putting the blame on me. <laughs> and then, you know, he helps with um, the wife for whatever reason. I always, I kind of, I actually forgot the reason why he helps the wife out. Um, <laughs> I think they and then all of a sudden old Toby's friends or in cahoots with the neighbors. Yeah, something like that. And then yeah, apparently come to find out he's in cahoots with the neighbors and the bad guy the whole time. Nah. Yeah, I didn't buy it. I was like, this is you could have done better here. Maybe some better motivation, maybe a different, you know, a more capable actor. So I don't know who the hell this guy is. I would have cast hints, you know what I mean? Like yeah. Yeah. put hints throughout the movie. Yeah, something. So it'd be like, oh yeah, he, yeah. So yeah, he's a secret bad guy. Um, for mine, it's reaching, but this is my reason. I'll explain it. I did put Carol Kane as the uh, the nanny, no. the Romanian nanny, I believe, mm-hmm. only because Disney just couldn't help themselves in 2005, and she is mostly a walking stereotype, just spouting off the yeah. jokes you expect to come from her. <laughs> Yeah, that was lazy and stupid. The whole, you know, he walks like Dracula. Like, oh my God, come on. A little agency here. Just yeah. Like, come on. It's like they couldn't get Jackie Chan the duck. So they were like, hey, we got Carol Kane. Let's just make her Romanian. And we Let's still get our jokes. It's like they just, it's like a weird itch that Disney just had to scratch. They're like, God damn it, we didn't get the duck like we wanted. Is Hollywood in 2005. We have not yet reached our racist quota for the film. We need something, people. Come on, brainstorm. What can we do, guys? Come on. Well, they're rich. They have an any. You're on the right track. Keep going with that. <laughs> we haven't we haven't gone after the Romani in a long people. Let's like in a long time. Let's do that. <laughs> like, all right. I like it. Let's do that. <laughs> I like it. But we're keeping the duck. Why? Because I want the duck. Because the duck can bite the North Korean dude's balls later and people will laugh. It's like, why would that happen? Because Vin Diesel told it to. Follow up. Keep up. <laughs> Racism sells still. I feel like that's supposed to the mantra in that office. Probably. I wouldn't be surprised. Now, uh, now. Now. Now, thankfully, people would be like, yeah, let's not do that. How's that sound, Disney? I don't know. You still see it from time to time. It sneaks in. It's it's not going away it's anytime so soon. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 who I had. And that, that's why, just because it felt like more of like, oh, we didn't get the fucking duck subplot we wanted. We kept the duck, just didn't get the subplot. But you know what? We'll put this um, Romanian nanny character in here and just have her spout off every stereotype you can think of. Yep. Works for me. <laughs> yep. Crazy. Uh, with that, uh, the Michael Bay worst filmmaking decision. Uh, had to reach for this one. Ultimately, I went with the soundtrack because I didn't know Smash Mouth did anything outside of All Star. So everyday superhero popping up twice in this movie. I was like, really? That's the best we could do. Disney's foot in the bill, sixty million dollar budget, and that's our big song. I mean, good, lo- good lord! How, how dare you diss the Smash Mouth? <laughs> I am not the first nor the last person to go after Smash Mouth. <laughs> Somebody once told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but I, I remember that song being everywhere, and then this song just felt so cliched. Like, oh, he's, you know ordinary average everyday superhero like oh my god <laughs> a little on the nose so i just <laughs> thought the soundtrack smash mouth was a hot smash mouth was a hot commodity back then. <laughs> not so much now and they also broke up they were barely anything in 2005 like they they had their moment for like two years and then everyone was like we're, we're good we're done <laughs> good smash mouth we got enough of all star we got it. Apparently, all that glitters ain't gold, so fuck off. (laughs) 
<laughs> I just want to listen to All Star. I heard it's that song head. on the radio a few months ago, and I had this moment of like, wow, I don't think I've ever heard this in the wild before. Like, th- yeah, this was a song, not just a movie device. <laughs> like, I had to be reminded. It was, it was weird. This was a this was a big hit song. That was a that was a win for Shrek when they got there. Like, oh shit, we got this song. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, so what do you have? I'm curious. Mine, we kind of talked about it earlier, and that was the film brief. I mean, briefly, thankfully, it's a fake out, but briefly having us think the oldest son joined a Nazi group. As soon as the subplot came and began, since, since it's been a while, I actually forgot how it ended up. So I didn't know we were getting to that point. But I remember thinking, like, why would you do this in a family movie? Like, why would you even think about going there? I get it. The punchline's like, oh, we're the sound of music, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, but why would you even tease that? <laughs> They're filming for families, Disney. Jesus, it's like, you didn't get your duck. Okay, we get it. So why did you stick? Why? Why did you have to be like, well, we're not getting that, but we are fucking going hard on everything else. Dude, so many of my letterbox reviews that I looked through were like, I did not know. Like, I forgot about the sound of music thing. So I audibly went like, what the fuck? A Nazi subplot? Like, where's this going? So, uh, you were, you're not alone. A lot of people forgot about the outcome of that and were like, what? What is this? Yeah, especially because, like, for some reason, hearing Vin Diesel say, you really think he's a Nazi? Like, it's coming out of Vin Diesel's mouth, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. When Brad Garrett to be like, this is sick. It's like, and also the kid's commitment. I mean, for community theater, he dyed his hair blonde and then, like, brought Nazi shit to school. Like, why did he do that? Yeah, and then it's like, dude, just say it. Just say what you're in. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, 2005. I guess we saw that stigma about theater kids. He would rather be. He would rather his family and school think he's a fucking Nazi than in musical theater. Like, yeah, that was 2005. I look. I'm at a point. Like, I know I've said it before. Like, I'm you know I'm turning 30 at the end of the year. I've realized I'm at a point where like all these teenage subplots piss me off. Um, recently, and the it had just wrapped up the the season of Superman and Lois. There was a subplot where their their one of their sons, John, great name, um, was helping sell a drug that like gives you like temporary superpower type thing. Huh, I heard of that. I'm seeing that and something else. Well, technically, the boys came out after this season. So shut up, and um, so yeah, shut your stupid mouth. Superman has existed longer than fucking the boys. This show and is. continue. Smallville was before Super, the boys, but whatever. Fuck you. We're not talking um, about Smallville, are we? It's, we're talking about Superman. We're saying and don't, don't need to be here, sir. Moving on. <laughs> Point is, the whole plot line was like he's doing it, but he's getting it from his girlfriend. The thing is, he gets caught, right? So he obviously gets in trouble because it's like, why are you selling? Tr-? Right? They understand getting in trouble, and they are. The school says this: Look, if you tell us who you're getting it from, we'll, we'll lax it a little bit on you because he's part of the football team, right? So they're pulling the stereotypical small town stuff. I, I so we both went to Blanco High School. Unfortunately, that shit's very well how that small town mentality works. Um, but that's the deal. But of course, it being his fucking girlfriend, him being a teenager, them not going to understand. He won't tell. And I literally, like, at least, like, the episodes, like, they did it for a couple episodes where they finally found out who he, he came clean, right? But for every episode they kept doing it, I was, like, yelling at the was like, just fucking tell them, you dumbass. Like, it's not worth destroying your your high school fucking career, whatever you fucking want to call it, your youth over a fucking gore, dude. It's Pop culture, movies, TV, so much of it has never fucking understood teenagers. And they always go stereotype. And it's annoying because, you know, we rarely get anything that actually shows like what, it, you know, what teenagers do or think or feel. Most of the time, it's this bullshit. So, yeah, yeah I get why you go there. Yeah. So it's like I kind of have like I've noticed as I've gone around, my tolerance for this kind of stuff is low. So, yeah, when it was like even doing this, I'm like, dude, just fucking tell them you're in the goddamn theater. Like, do you realize the implication at all of them thinking you're a fucking Nazi? Or yeah. it technically would be a neo-Nazi is the correct term. Um, but, like, do you have any fucking idea? Do you just come clean? It's not a big fucking deal. It is weird how this movie treats it like it's the end of the world. Like, God forbid they think he's 
you know, the implication is like, you know, that he doesn't want anyone thinking he's gay. That's what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. Fine. That's nobody's going to say that, but that's what this is all about. And it's fucking stupid. You know, you like theater, do theater. You like football, do football. You like wrestling, do wrestling. If you're a Nazi, fuck you. That's- yeah, if you're that, like, fuck you. There's, there's no place in that for you. So, yeah, it, yeah, my, like I said, my tolerance for this, like, like I said, when I, was, I mean, I, overall, I did enjoy the season Superman Lois, but yeah, that plot line, I was literally like, you, you would laugh. It was like episode after episode of me on my couch going, fucking say it. Tell them this is the dumb shit. Why I uh, like this is the reason I stopped watching that shit because it's always there's always some stupid ass teenage subplot in all of this stuff, and I don't need that anymore. I'm over it. So no, I will not be watching Superman and Lois. I mean, it's a good show outside of that. I like I like the I like the actress that got to play uh, Superman and Lois. I think they're both good. I've been looking up everything about it, so I will get everything spoiled for me, so I will never be able to enjoy it. Have you seriously been doing that? Yes, I have. I know everything about what happens in the season two finale and all that shit. Like, I get it. I don't want to watch it. Wow. Why do you look it up then? I don't understand the logic. Well, actually, here. it comes to me. I mean, like, I follow, like, you know, the Superman pages and shit on Facebook and they'll post, like, oh, what happened in last night? Blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, well, all right, sure. Okay. I was about to say, I, I don't understand if you don't want to watch it while you're looking up. It comes to me and I just. I just click on it because I'm like, well, yeah. I sure. like, like I said, I do stand by that. I think it's better than like almost half of the fucking Arrowverse shows we got on since Arrow ever even came out. But that's the plot got my nerves. I was like, God damn, stop it. Yeah. See, I don't give half a shit about Superman's kids. If I want to watch a Superman show, I want to watch it for Superman. So you, you, we get plenty of Superman show. I feel like we get more. Well, kids are awesome. Man. No, we actually get plenty of Superman. And you get plenty of Superman. Well, good for you. I give, you give I give it a year. Saying, you a year. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just saying you do get plenty of Superman. You probably get the same out you got in Smallville. Honestly. Yeah, we got no Superman in Smallville. Then you definitely get more, more in this than you did in Smallville. Because you do see him in the suit at least, like, at the very minimum, once an episode. He was, the, he was the blur for 10 seasons. And then in the last 20 seconds of the finale, he was Superman. <laughs> okay, yeah. See, this one's already doing it better because you at least at a minimum get him in that suit once per episode at a minimum. Doing and they refer to him as Superman. So that's nice. Oh uh, yeah. But yeah, the point is this kind of plot line, it just kind of grates on my nerves. The whole like, let's them think that. And like I said, just why in a family film? Would you even try? It's the one part of this film I think this does not age that well. Is the and like it's brief. I get it. And they luckily go like, oh wait, he's actually gonna play it. Sound music, but you didn't need to tease it. You didn't even need to fucking tease it. For me, it's not even so much about the the, the Nazi fake out. It's the fact that the real subplot is he doesn't want to tell anybody he's in the theater because they don't. He doesn't want them to think he's you know not what he is. And that that got on my nerves more than anything. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that guy. When I was so excited, it was another moment of me going like, "Why did you put this stupid? What you think is a teenagers are probably, but I mean, many of these films are famous for having people do shit, the misunderstandings that would never actually happen in real life because we use proper pronouns, we tell people things so there's no miscommunication. Yeah, it is. It's amazing sometimes. Uh, well, yeah, I get it. Good, good pick. Oh yeah. Uh but now and I feel like this is a little bit easier for us. Uh the server lining. The the one thing uh the one positive we took from this film. Again, probably a lot easier because I feel like there's a lot you could actually kind of do with this with this movie. Yeah. So what do you got? Two words. Brad Garrett. <laughs> Brad Garrett is a funny son of a bitch. And his role as the Merninator is hilarious. He's such a great asshole. Just the vice principal who's such a macho prick. And also just constantly like putting down the active Navy SEAL. Like, way to go, guy. Real smart. <laughs> yeah, I love how like he's he knows he's an active Navy SEAL, but he keeps feeling into me. And I'm like, that dude could kick your ass. Like, SEALs you don't want to fuck with. If in case anyone's wondering, don't fuck with a Navy SEAL. See, I did not need to be told that. <laughs> but apparently some people do. Um I just don't lose that fight so quick. Absolutely. But yeah, his whole bit and then like the scene where where 
Vin Diesel just puts him in his place. It's so good. I love the whole character. I love he's constantly reporting about like the baloney situation. It's like, well, if I had the proper facilities, if I could do this correctly, we'd have we'd have a culprit on our hands. Like this is all he's thinking about. It's all he cares about. I did I did really like the wrestling scene when like as Vin Diesel's like d- discussing the moves to the audience. <laughs> and like when he like he's like, ah, see, we have a classic um last you know, ditch effort tactic, a sign of desperation. <laughs> My favorite bit of that was when he's on the he's on the mat and his, his the wrestling team comes to help him and he's like, I don't need your help. Nope. And he struggles and he's like, Can I get some help here, please. <laughs> I can't move my neck. Oh, like you want to play prison rules? Fine. Like just such a such a dick. The dude who peaked in high school. <laughs> yeah, I, I I do like when like when this was like, so when do you want to do this? Oh, the wrestle. Let's do it today. <laughs> <laughs> mess with the bull, you get the horns, and he does that like <laughs> like bull thing. <laughs> So he is really, I remember it's funny when I, I, I do remember he, I remembered when I was watching this again, because like I said, we rented this when I was like a kid and it was like the family film we watched from um, Video Shack. And I do remember because my mom was a big Everybody Loves Raymond fan. So that's how she knew him. So she's like, oh, hey, it's, it's uh, the guy from Everybody Loves. She goes, his character is so funny on that show. And sure enough, she was dying, laughing at everything coming out of his mouth. Like the guy just knows that, like you said, the way he like delivers his lines, the way he moves his hands, like he's he's fucking funny. Something in his eyes, like the way he like like looks upward at people, like sarcastically. It's like Brad Garrett's funny. I've always really liked him. <laughs> yeah, no, that yeah, he is fine. And he, I do agree, he's definitely a silver lining in this. And Vin Diesel does actually play a pretty role off him in their scenes together. Yeah, they do good. They do good. <laughs> yeah. What do you got? Uh, for me, we kind of t- we touched on it earlier at the beginning of the episode, and that's that this is to me like a nice reminder of when Disney did try harder on their live action films, like we talked about, right? It's not them focusing just on hey, we have Cinderella, make it live action, hey, we got Beauty and the Beast, make it live action. Um, but take out the music, we don't want to keep the damn music that everybody knows and loves so much. Milan, make it live action, do not put in that fucking music whatsoever. Um, or or, they do like Aladdin and the Lion King, and they keep the music, but they fuck it up. Yeah, they're like, let's do it, but not do it right. Um, <laughs> you know, they're not focusing on that. They're not look. They're not taking a stroll through their theme park, going, what can we adapt next? We had a lot of success with Pirates, guys. A lot of success. What else do we got? We can do, huh? I wonder. I'm still it, waiting on yeah, the Epcot movie. Oh yeah, they did announce that, didn't they? Wait, they, they really? <laughs> did they? I don't know. I know at one point they announced some stuff. I'm like, really? They're making that into a movie? I was joking, but honestly, like, I don't, I wouldn't put it past them. I don't know. I, it's not Disney, but you know, we're getting a Spirit Halloween movie. Like the the store that sells costumes. Yes. Christopher Lloyd's in it. <laughs> what? Like. So what is it like about the store or like a killer's losing the store? Shit, I, I think like spooky shit happens in the store. Did but you know that- they haven't they haven't revealed the title, I think. So I was just referring it to it as the spirit Halloween horror movie. Jesus Christ. Are you aware that Jerry Seinfeld is currently developing a movie about the creation of Pop Tarts? <laughs> we are so out of ideas. They're making a movie about the origins of the flaming hot Cheeto. Like this is where we're at right now. I thought we hit the point of no ideas when we were taking board games and making them into movies, but the fact that we're like people care enough about pop tarts to know its origins. We're turning food into movies now. That's that's where we're at. <laughs> to think we hit our lowest point with the emoji movie, and yet we found a way to go lower. Oh. I can't wait for like you know the Jolly Green Giant movie. Or Captain Crunch, the the musical, the, the Slim Jam movie. I do a Slim Jam. <laughs> Slim Jam. If they have an animated, if they do an animated Slim Jam movie with Macho Man Randy Savage. I will be there. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> the Kool Aid movie. They're going to be back to the Kool Aid Man. <laughs> I I honestly, you know what? Possibly in the next like five six years, I would not be surprised. 
all it takes is one of these films to be a big hit. And then they're like, yep, we're going to keep doing that. Yeah. So here's hoping the Pop-Tart movie crumbles. Because eh, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with more. I don't like, look, I like Pop-Tarts as much as the next guy. It's a quick thing sometimes grab in the morning, but I don't need a movie on them. Pop-Tart 2, Unfrosted Cinnamon. <laughs> Pop-Tarts versus Toaster Strudels. Coming oh. to a theater near you. Food, C- cinematic food universe. Jesus Christ. Guys, can we just stick with Sausage Party for our fucking food movies? Good Lord. Uh, I actually really like Sausage Party. But yeah, okay. Well, yep, here, here we are. We, we found a way to go lower. Oh, God. We will make anything into a movie. Um, But yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, but, yeah. It, like I was saying before I got really sidetracked on that. Jesus, that just destroyed my brain. Yeah, I just, I really, you know, I know we talked about it earlier, but I really do miss when they tried harder. Like it's like you were talking about, we got Holes, Santa Claus, this movie. I would I would honestly say, remember the Titans? Like we got a lot of very cool stuff. The Watcher in the Woods. I want to say they also did something wicked this way counts, but I might be wrong on that one. I don't I might be wrong. Yeah, let me let me confirm that for you. You confirm that because I'm not sure, but that's another film that if you haven't seen any one good gateway horror for the family, something wicked this way comes. Wonderful film. Um, 1983. Um, standing by. Yeah, looking for a production company. Walt Disney's Golden Oak Ranch. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, so it is a Disney film. Yes, it is. Okay. There you go. Something we, yeah. Back when they were just willing to experiment and actually kind of do stuff with these live action films, I do. I, I miss it. I do. I really. And like you said, even with something like this or like Freaky Friday, no, it wasn't the best stuff ever, but it was an easy way to kill 90 minutes. Like the, the films were no harm. They were funny in their own way. I miss the days when every movie's goal wasn't a billion dollar box office. When we could just enjoy, you know, a modest success when it was little, when it was, you know, smaller scale. I do miss that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. They talk about I've, on like things like the movie curtain stuff. They talk about that, like because of how cinema is now with like they need to come out with these franchises and stuff like that now, because that's what people are seeing. You've kind of seen theater wise what they call the death of the mid tier movies. Mm. Films like this where they were like usually original Usually they won't meant to like be the next big thing. They're just there to offer you a good time and have some fun. Yeah. They're mo- usually modestly budgeted, modestly successful, and we moved on. But because of how cinema's become, you pre- like we saw re- a recent example where Nightmare Alley got obliterated because they opened it the same fucking weekend as Spider Man. Like no one saw it. Everyone to go see Spider Man, and that's that's what they're seeing. They're seeing that these films are making huge money. These films aren't, so they're not investing in those as much. I mean, and yes, now I would argue streaming has kind of brought the mid-tier films to our home. No. Now, because they just go to streamer. And in a way, that is nice. Like, you know, obviously we've had some gems that we've seen on Hulu, um, like uh, Vacation Friends, things like that, that are really good and I have really enjoyed. Um, but I do miss just them being, like, them being a cinematic option theater, I guess what I'm saying. That's the thing. I miss options. I miss going to the movies and being like, what could I see today? Instead of like, there's really only one movie here that's huge. Everything else you saw last week. It's like, all right. I, I, I do miss that. I miss, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You do, do you know what it's like sometimes when like when I was trying to get tickets for things like everything ever all at once or Studio 666? Yeah. Like it was a bit, I had to wait till almost the damn weekend to get a ticket because they were like, yeah, we got like 50 showings of Spider-Man or 50 showings of the Batman, but yeah. you might have a theater open for this movie. I'm uh, I'm kind of lucky because I I have like, you know, I've got Santicos, I've got Draft House, I've got Evo, I've got Regal. I've got a lot of options around me and odds are one of those theaters is going to have, you know, a movie I'm after. But like, you know, you're in a much different situation where you don't have as many options. And if you move, if one of your theaters doesn't have the movie, you're not going to get to see it. And that sucks. Yeah. That, that recently happened. I know you guys won't. I know you won't be a fan of it, but that recently did happen with uh, Crimes of the Future. It was playing nowhere near me. Yeah. You know, it got open wide on June 10th. And even me, I, had, I had one theater and one showing. 
So like, even I had to be like, if I don't get that, I'm not going to be able to see this because this movie will be gone by next week. Yeah, because guess what? It, guess the weekend it came out on Jurassic World fucking Dominion. And guess we got all of the showings. Dominion. Yep. It, and also, you know, Top Gun was still there. And um, I think what was Lightyear out at that point? No, no, no. It came out the following weekend. Okay. See, it's all bleeding now. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And it's just, and even then, like, you know, I've been liking, for the most part, Cinemark that I'm, I'm close to. We'll play these films for the most part. Crown's Future was like the weird fluke that I didn't get to see. Um, but even then, I've noticed when I go to see something like when I went to go see Everything Everywhere Once or one of those small scale movies, they always put in the same fucking theater room. It's like the same one every damn time. And they forget about it. Like I, so many times I've gone to see those films and they leave the fucking theater door open. It's like even the workers just forget that theater exists. Oh, that's... That people that's are shit. watching a movie in there. And so many times I've thought about just getting it being like, hey, does someone want to close the fucking doors so it's not this orange shit on my screen? And a predominantly sucks, pretty man. dark film. Wow. I've, I've, yeah. had, I've had times, like one time I bought tickets to, um, what was it, a movie? And uh, like I was it. So they just like, I guess they didn't notice that I had the tickets. So they just canceled the showing and refunded my money. <laughs> and I was like, what? But I was gonna yeah, I had to like figure something else out. So like sometimes they'll just be like, eh, it's not worth it. And just, you know, replace that with a showing of like the big movie. And yeah, I heard that was happening to a lot of people with um, Nightmare Alley. A lot of people were bitching that their theaters were just canceling their tickets without telling them and then putting in more Spider-Man showings. See, I love Spider-Man, but that's bullshit. Like I'm very much an all films are created equal kind of guy. Yeah, like I like going to the theater for different types of film. Don't get me wrong, I love going to see the new MCU film or whenever Star Wars is actually doing a good film. Uh, the new Star Wars film, you know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever, insert any blockbuster film at this point. At the same time, I also like going to see the small stuff like Everything Everywhere All at Once, Studio 666X. Um, uh, in August, it's going to be Bodies, Bodies, Bodies next. That looks really good to me. Um, but, you know, I like going to see those small scale films as well. Because any film I can see at theater is a film I can see at theater. I have nothing against streaming. Don't get me wrong. I will watch plenty of stuff on the streamers. Um, but nothing's taking away that theater experience. And I want to see some... Of course, I want to see the next big, huge blockbuster. But I also want to give that smaller indie film that, if I'm being honest, is usually made with more heart and soul yeah. a chance at the theater. Like, for me... like. Again, I and I know you know you're you're more into it than I was, but for me, Dominion, I didn't feel any heart and soul from Trevor o in that film. I just felt like he was just being big for the sake of being big, and didn't really deliver on the story he promised. Yeah. Whereas the smaller scale films, I like again, I'll mention because I really liked it, but everything, ever at once, like I felt the heart and soul in that movie. You could tell they put all of their fucking passion into that film. Yeah, I've often equated it to that, you know, that episode of SpongeBob where he has to take on King Neptune in a fry cook battle and Neptune makes like a thousand burgers in a second. SpongeBob takes, you know, 20 minutes with one, but his is like amazing and Neptune's tastes terrible. Like effort matters. <laughs> and you can tell when, when a movie's been like, you know, mass produced or has been one guy's singular vision. And usually those are the better movies. Yeah. And it's why I would argue horror has thrived as much as people want to come down. And it's why horror thrives so much. So much of horror has the better, the best ones has relied on someone putting the heart sold. Sometimes blood sweat too into that movie. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Like I just saw the black phone, very delightful film, very exciting, creepy, enjoyable, something I'm going to remember. Like, honestly, I, I don't really, I don't remember a lot of dominion. I liked it at the time, but I couldn't give you details. <laughs> So yeah, I seen. Yeah, so yeah, I I like how my 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 silver lining led to this nice little moment. Um, but yeah, you know, I could talk about this all day. How I feel about when it comes to like cinema and all this good stuff. I can do this all. But day. ultimately, we have to move on to our next segment, known as "What's in the Box." in a fucking box! Give me the gun. 
this is an interesting bunch of letterbox reviews because there's a lot of them that were kind of like us like i watched this as a kid and you know i was revisiting it and it's pretty good or it's shit or like what is this or nazis really but i did find um i've got four for you uh that i think are pretty funny this has a 2.5 out of five on letterboxd so not our worst uh film which is good no no it's gonna be hard to top 1.6 green lantern (laughs) all right i know some movies i might just top it oh yeah i've been looking up some stuff i'm like if we get to that god damn we're gonna lose some brain cells there's there's two movies I ordered in a cell that I know could probably beat it, and I look forward to adding them to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, so here are these reviews. This one's from Mike McCabe. Vin Diesel should do more family films, especially since he knows a lot about family. Four stars. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't going to make it out of a Vin Diesel podcast without talking about family. <laughs> no, no, it's all he talks about in one particular series. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this one made me laugh. This is from Andy Young, and he didn't give this a score, by the way. He just left this gem, so there's no score. Okay. <laughs> there's a scene where Vin Diesel finds out one of the kids he's babysitting dyed his hair blonde and had a swastika armband in his locker. I stopped there because I had to leave to go see F9 and probably won't finish this. Give that Nazi punk hell, Vin. <laughs> <laughs> He just stopped there and was like, kick his ass. <laughs> I'm going to go watch F9. <laughs> oh, all right. Here's number three. This is from Desiree. This movie's got everything. Guys with tits, wrestling unitards, spies, a montage, Nazi youth subplot, Girl Scouts, and the military industrial complex. Three stars. <laughs> Anything you could possibly want in a movie. <laughs> yeah, it's the movie includes a little bit of everything, including a Nazi subplot for like five minutes. <laughs> so weird. And this one just made me laugh. This is from E. Dat Lin. Not as funny as the Chronicles of Riddick. One star. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> That is all that's in the box. <laughs> okay. Not as funny as Chronicles of Riddick. All right. I can't tell who is being insulted in that. We are. Chronicles of Riddick on the pacifier. The audience. That's who's getting insulted here. <laughs> Especially if you saw both movies. I have. So. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, before I reveal what's going on next week, let's knock out the social media stuff first. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Filmgasm Productions. If you want to share us a recommendation, feel free to email us at filmgasm at gmail.com. If you'd like to donate, support us in that way, you can find us on Anchor. And finally, feel free to go on our site, filmgasm.com, for reviews, shows, articles, and all of our episodes. Next week, we'll be looking at the 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 cultiest of cult classics Dolph Lundgren starring live action adaptation to some masterpiece Masters of the Universe by the power of Grayskull I can't wait <laughs> should be interesting oh yeah He-Man is uncharted territory for me like outside of Robot Chicken I don't know anything but names like He-Man, Skeletor, Battle Cat. That's all I got. So I'm excited to learn and also see Dolph Lundgren scantily clad taking on Frank Langella in a pretty shitty skull costume. So let's let's do this. Let's do it. The most I know, but I know it's a cartoon. Like I said, I know Karen Smith did that recent uh, series. I know Josh watched because he's a big fan. I know a lot of people are big fans of it. The only thing I even knew about was because uh my OG crush, so I'm sure Geller voices one of the characters in it. I think she's like one of the main characters. So but I was like, eh, it's animated. I'm not actually gonna see her. So <laughs> uh, your dedication to honesty is a continued source of inspiration to us all, my friend. I know. I'm I am here for that. <laughs> 
But yeah, Fantastic. E-Man. I'm going to be very fun tomorrow. Going back to the 80s. I think our last 80s was cocktail. Uh, I think so. Well, we're getting into the, the back half of the schedule that I created. And it was brought to my attention because I didn't even think about it. But admittedly, I also blame you because you're the one that uh, you, you came up with the movies on the list that I picked from. So I'm, I'm also putting just as much blame on you, buddy. Um, but we had a lot of 2000s and 90s films. So I was like, let me uh, vary it more. So you're going to see a little more variety in the second half of the year. Well, first of all, fuck you. Second of all, <laughs> it's a very varied list. And it's hardly our fault that. Well, now it's you- very, but before that. At least I'm making a list. It's not our fault that the early 2000s, twice. the 2000s, 2010s have such an influx of shit movies. That's not our fault. That's and true. honestly, the list is pretty heavy on those decades because that's just the way the Hollywood worked. It's it's more like there's just the input of m- the amount of films increase as the years have gone on. Because, yeah. again, the streamers and um, before that, you know, the home video market when that blew up. So it's just more like the the in. The amount of films are just like blown up in recent years. But I have like, I've taken a look at what we've got coming up and we've got a lot of, well, I won't say classics, but um, a lot of older films that have not been like reevaluated in recent years. So we'll be happy to take a few for the team. I look, I'm already taking a few for a team hosting this podcast. So weekly <laughs> taking a few for the team. I do. We have fun. It's a place to just kind of bitch, not enjoy that. Yeah, or apparently be like, you know, this Vin Diesel film, it's not that bad. <laughs> um, on Filmgasm, we'll be continuing the gauntlet, looking at the horror. That's right. I said horror. Sci-fi masterpiece, The Terminator. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. Oh, yeah. We will be back. We will be back. There it is. On Oscar Sunday. They'll be looking at the incredibly underrated Tom Hanks starring film Road to Perdition. I look, I mean it when I say this. If you haven't checked this out, I was I was on this team. So I'm not coming after anyone. I was in the same boat for a while. But if you haven't seen this film, check it out. It's really fucking good. Yeah, one of the Great, one of the best gangster films of the 2000s and a one of the few films where uh, Tom Hanks is a pretty straightforward bad guy. So pretty cool. Yeah. So check that out. Like I said, give that give that film a try if you haven't. Solid film. But until then, if you have a male nanny in your life, make sure he's there to babysit and not actually a seal on an undercover mission. See you next week on Beyond the Bed. <laughs> Thank you.